So my lab is really interested in understanding nutrient scavenging processes, and we focus on a very specific organelle called the lysosome. And you all remember from Cell Biology 101 sometime during your career that lysosomes are um, a highly degradative organelle that's present in all cells, um, but has maybe a very special role in a cancer setting that I'll talk to you about today. So um, as I mentioned, we, you know, if you think about it, all, Organelles provide quite a unique environment for the execution of very specific reactions in the cell. And perhaps then it's not so surprising that in the context of a tumor or many other diseases that alterations in the size, number, composition, and function of these organelles can have a very important role in, during tumor evolution. Now what's important to note here that that, that role is not necessarily due to uh, direct mutations in genes associated with these different compartments, but rather are associated with driver oncogenes and, mutation, and, and uh, tumor suppressor mutations that are occurring. Um, and so this allows for a certain level of plasticity that allows these organelles to change their activity uh, during the course of tumor evolution. So as we've heard today, there are obvious, uh, obviously important roles for generation of uh, tumor-specific uh, uh, cyclotome, changes in the uh, transcription and translation of certain proteins that, uh, that map the um, proteome of a particular tumor cell, um, ATP generation from mitochondria, and then obviously uh, breakdown of, um, and recycling of nutrients uh, through the lysosome compartment, which I'll talk to you more about today. So pancreatic cancer is one really beautiful example where we have quite dramatic alterations in organelles. And it's really work that was done originally by Alec Kimmelman's lab and Cosimo that revolutionized the way we think about metabolism in pancreatic cancer and really formed the foundation for a lot of the subsequent work that has come to date um, in, uh, and, um, and the work that we've uh, built, and obviously my work and others have built upon a lot of these very seminal findings that uh, they have originally shown. And this centers around constitutive activation of nutrient scavenging pathways in pancreatic cancer cells. It's quite specific to tumor cells and uh, does not exist in normal cells. And what these scavenging pathways uh, uh, constitute is constitutive activation of um, a cellular recycling process called autophagy, and as we've heard from Cosmos talk, macrophenocytosis. So for those of you who uh, don't know too much about autophagy, it's an evolutionarily conserved cellular recycling process. Uh, that involves this uh, generation of an um, intracellular membrane that encapsulates quite diverse uh, material from ranging from protein aggregates, lipid droplets, sometimes to whole organelles. Um, and then these cargos are delivered to the lysosome, as is macrophenocytic uh, proteins that are taken up via uh, bulk uptake. So what's important, as I mentioned, is that both of these pathways converge here on the lysosome for degradation of this, of this material and then recycling um, of these uh, breakdown products back to the uh, cytoplasm. So the lysosome, you know, until very recently, was really you know, considered a fairly boring organelle. It's where you send things you know, that you want to get rid of, um, and that's about it, really devoid of any real regulation, unlike, say, the mitochondria that um, is a very important metabolic organelle that's subject to very specific regulation, both at the uh, transcriptional level and then also in terms of fission and fusion. But more recently, maybe over the past five to six years, there's been um, a huge amount of data that implies that the lysosome can actually function as a command and control center for important uh, growth signaling pathways. So mTOR activity is, uh, uh, is it, uh, activation of mTOR is uh, dependent on lysosomal localization and the fact that lysosome function can give rise to all these uh, essential building blocks, so amino acids, fatty acids, nucleosides, and sugars. So we, uh, so again, uh, one thing I wanted to just point out was obviously in the context of autophagy, uh, which is highly dependent on lysosomal function for, um, for proper activity, is, uh, has a number of different genes, proteins, that are involved in all the different steps, so from nucleation to elongation and closure, docking and fusion with lysosomes. And there are a number of essential lysosomal proteins, um, membrane proteins, transporters, and enzymes that are required for the proper degradation of this cargo. So what we uh, wanted to ask going forward was, 
these constitutive nuclear, uh, nutrient scavenging pathways that we see in pancreatic cancer, how are they activated? How do they remain constitutively active? And then from a metabolic standpoint, how do they uh, influence the metabolic landscape of these cells, these processes? So we started by asking a very simple question. Uh, we looked at the uh, activation of this pathway in PDA from a morphological standpoint. So what I'm showing you here is uh, LC3, which is stained in green. Um, now, autophagy is a process that is only activated in a normal cell in response to nutrient stress, primarily amino acid starvation. So you can see here in these HPDE cells, which is our normal equivalent, we don't see any GFP staining indicating that autophagy is switched off. And then you see it in the starved condition indicating that we have biogenesis of autophagosomes. In contrast, in PDA, and as, as has been shown by Alec Timmerman's group regionally, these cells constitutively uh, have high levels of autophagosome biogenesis, um, regardless of whether they're in the fed or the starved state. What's more important also, what's also important is we took uh, treatment-naive patient PDA samples with uh, their matched normal uh, uh, tissue, and we can also see a, a highly uh, upregulated biogenesis of uh, lysosomes as well. Uh, so what this told us from a morphological standpoint is all the machinery, the compartments, the organelles that were required for high levels of autophagy and lysosomal function uh, is present in PDA, much more so than it is in comparison to normal cells. So we then were quite um, surprised to see that all of this machinery could be seen at the transcriptional, upregulation of this machinery can be seen at the transcriptional level. So what I'm showing you here is a, uh, a heat map of about 160 conserved autophagy lysosomal genes that we compiled and used to probe multiple primary, uh, so uh, patient PDA um, and match normal tissue. And you can see that the majority are very highly upregulated at the transcriptional level. Um, again, the signature using gene set enrichment analysis is enriched in multiple independent PDA data sets. And what this told us was that there was a coordinated upregulation of all the autophagy lysosomal genes in uh, PDA compared to normal. So this was pretty striking to us and, and very different from what people have normally thought about autophagy as being a, an acute process that switched on and switched off um, in response to nutrients, uh, primarily through the activation of uh, uh, nutrient responsive kinases like AMPK and mTOR. So this was a very different process. This was telling us that transcriptionally, there was a, um, a coordinated upregulation of these genes. And more recently, in the last few years, there's been a, a really great appreciation for this process, this transcriptional regulation of autophagy and lysosomal biogenesis. And number of, uh, a number of groups have shown master transcription factors, either that activate uh, autophagosome lysosome gene expression, or that suppress it in some context in a very tissue-specific uh, manner. The first reports that were uh, published, some beautiful work done by Andrea Barabio's uh, lab in two science papers in 2009 and 2011, showed the, uh, this family uh, member, TFEB, and also its other um, family members, TFE3 and MITF, to be master transcriptional regulators of this process. So what's also significant in this context is that these transcription factors are bona fide oncogenes in a small subset of cancers. So you, uh, some of you may know uh, that MITF is a amplified oncogene in melanoma, and promoter translocations and N-terminal uh, fusions of uh, TFEB and TFE3 have been uh, identified in a subset of kidney cancers and in some soft tissue sarcomas. Although outside of these three cancer types, no known role for any of these transcription factors in any other tumor types has been shown, and certainly a role for these transcription factors in regulating autophagy lysosomal gene expression in a uh, cancer setting has also never been described. So we asked whether you know, the uh, constitutive autophagy lysosomal gene signature that we see in PDA might be a result of the increased expression or activity of these family members. So what we first did was to look at levels of expression. We were really excited to see that uh, these family members were upregulated in a number of um, these classical PDA uh, cell lines. We could also look at, we also see upregulation in some primary patient-derived cultures as well. 
Um, we did immunohistochemistry in patient PDA. This is TUFE3 that I'm showing you here. Um, we can see very nice expression um, in the uh, tumor epithelium, no expression in the stroma compared to the uh, normal controls. Um, and this is also quantified here. So this told us that there was upregulation of these transcription factors. We don't see any genomic alterations, no amplifications or mutations. Um, we also went on to look at whether the activity of these transcription factors were altered in PDA. And the reason why we looked at this is because their activity is also coupled to the nutrient state of the cell. So what I mean by that is that it was shown by some very nice work, also from Andrea Balavia's group, now in collaboration with David Sabatini's lab, that these transcription factors in full nutrient conditions are phosphorylated by mTOR complex 1, which keeps them inactive in the cytoplasm. However, upon nutrient starvation, when mTOR is inactive, this phosphorylation does not occur. And this allows for these transcription factors to move into the nucleus, recognize a conserved element in the promoter of autophagy lysosomal genes, and activate transcription. So this was the cycle that occurs in normal cells in response to changes in external nutrient availability. So we asked whether this was also the case in uh, PDA. So as I mentioned, this is just uh, HPD cell to our normal equivalent expressing, in this case, a GFP, TUV3. You can see in the fed state, it's cytoplasmic. However, upon starvation, it quickly moves into the nucleus. What we find, in contrast, is that in PDA cells, these transcription factors are always in the nucleus, both in the fed state and in the starved state. This is for all the family members um, in multiple PDA cell lines and patient-derived uh, cultures. And also, if you remember from the IHC that I showed you before, our staining pattern in patient PDA was also very highly nuclear. So but this obviously poses two important questions. Is there some alteration in this phosphorylation? Uh, is mTOR, is there a, an alteration in mTOR activity in these cells? Um, and in data that I'm not showing you, uh, we show that mTOR activity is very high in pancreas cancer cells as it is in many other tumor types. We do see a decrease in the levels of phosphorylation of these transcription factors, but it's not enough to um, account for this constitutive nuclear localization. So we asked whether there was maybe a phosphorylation independent mechanism that might be at play here. So to begin to answer this question, we took an unbiased approach. We did uh, mass spec. We did affinity purification and mass spec uh, analysis to look, try and identify uh, interactors that were cancer specific that might influence subcellular localization. And what we did find was a normal uh, non-PDA cells. And this was a nuclear import protein called important 8 or IPO8. So what are these? They're in, the importance are, fa uh, are part of a family of about 19 carrioferrin beta nuclear transporters. Uh, they recognize cargo in the cytoplasm, mediate translocation through the nuclear pore complex. And then competitive binding with GTD-bound RAN leads to their release of the cargo and then recycling of the important back out into the cytoplasm. So we were, you know, this was really exciting for us because obviously IPO8, if you, you know, do a Google search, there's not really a lot known about this particular import protein in terms of its um, cohort of cargos, whether it has a cancer-specific role, there's no crystal structure. It also doesn't recognize a classical NLS. So, um, and so we went on to ask whether important eight binding and uh, expression was important for the nuclear localization of these transcription factors. So what we also see is that first IPO8 is very highly upregulated in pancreatic cancer versus uh, normal tissue, which is also really great for us. Um, and then in subsequent studies, we went on to show that uh, if we knock down IPO8, we completely suppress nuclear localization of these transcription factors. So it's required for maintaining MIT TFE proteins in the nucleus, but it's not required in normal cells. So just in summary of this part, um, what we identified in, in pancreatic cancer is that this constitutive nuclear uh, um, nutrient scavenging pathway, autophagy lysosomal, um, uh, the autophagy lysosomal pathway, was regulated by a family of transcription factors, the MIT TFE factors that are upregulated in PDA. But their activity is also tightly regulated by nuclear translocation. They have to bind to an import protein, which itself is also upregulated, that allows for their constitutive nuclear localization and coordinate activation of this autophagy lysosomal gene signature. Now, we went on to ask 
Is this required then for maintaining the proper functioning of this organelle system? So to do this, and I'm summarizing a lot of data here, but um, just to give you a quick overview, if we knock down any one of these transcription factors, we can see a coordinate drop in all these autophagy lysosomal genes in PDA. We don't see this in normal cells. So again, this is very specific for pancre uh, pancreatic cancer cells. Um, we also see a quite an aberrant lysosomal morphology when we lose, when we knock down um, the MIT-PAC proteins. And this is reminiscent of what you would see in a number of lysosomal storage disorders or upon loss of uh, lysosomal acidification. Which it's, and it's usually telling us that, um, that there's an accumulation of cargo, and that's why these lysosomes become quite, quite larger. So by EM, we could see that there was cargo accumulation. But we also performed a number of assays to look at the functioning of this organelle system as a whole. We can see that um, autophagosome maturation and fusion with lysosomes is impaired. Macrophenocytic uptake and degradation is also lost. And we can see a, a dramatic increase in overall lysosomal pH that we could measure quite specifically. So lysosomal pH in, in, in cancer cells is usually about pH 4. And following lots of these transcription factors, we see an increase in pH to about a pH 6, which is a really profound increase. Um, and this is associated with the fact that these transcription factors regulate essential components of the VATPAs that maintains lysosomal acidification. Um, as well as a lot of the cathepsins that are responsible for degradation of the cargo need to uh, function only at um, acidic pH. So quite, we see quite a profound alteration in, um, in, uh, autophagy, in the entire autophagy lysosomal system following the loss of these transcription factors. Now, obviously, this had a profound effect on uh, tumor growth, both in an in vitro context. These are um, just colony formation assays. I'd just also like to point out that these cells don't need to upregulate all three family members. They only need to upregulate one, and they, and which is what they do. They generally tend to have a unique uh, reliance on one of these family members, and knocking down one of them is sufficient to uh, cause all these phenotypes. And we can, to some extent, rescue some of these phenotypes with other family members, which is also really interesting. Um, in an in vivo context, obviously, we see quite a dramatic um, impairment in growth. Now, going forward, as I mentioned at the start of my talk, lysosomal mediated degradation can give rise to a number of diff all, all the different essential building blocks that a, a tumor cell might need, amino acids, fatty acids, nucleosides, and sugars. So we asked whether impairing lysosomal function leads to a decrease in all these building blocks or potentially one building block specifically. So, that gi so this gives us an idea of what these pathways are sequestering and targeting for degradation. So again, we took an unbiased approach. We did um, global metabolomics following knockdown of TUC3. And we found that while we do see some small changes in the levels of certain nucleotides and lipids, no changes in carbohydrates, by far the most profound decreases were associated with all the alpha amino acids and many of their uh, breakdown products, which implies that proteins are the primary substrates for degradation in these cells. Um, we repeated this, so we confirmed this with targeted mass spec for some of the top hits. These are branched-chain amino acids and um, uh, glutamate. And you can see here uh, very nice decreases following knockdown of TUC3, no change in normal cells. So this was also done in full nutrient conditions, which tells us that lysosomal mediated degradation of amino acids is important for maintaining cellular amino acid levels in PDA cells in full nutrients. We could also repeat this by, we see the same effects if we directly block the lysosome using baflomycin or a lysosomal inhibitor, or if you knock down um, an ATG protein along the um, autophagy pathway. So this was the model, and we published this last year. So in, in normal cells, the MIT TFE proteins under full nutrient conditions are phosphorylated by mTOR and sequestered in the cytoplasm, which ensures that uh, the autophagy lysosomal system is not switched on when you're in full nutrients. But in pancreatic cancer cells, the situation is very different. You maintain high mTOR activity, but to bypass the negative regulation of this kinase, they upregulate, a nuclear, they upregulate the MIT TFE proteins to begin with, but they also upregulate an important binding partner, a nuclear import protein 
that ensures that it, it is trafficked into the nucleus and it remains there and, and enables it to then activate this autophagy lysosomal gene signature uh, constitutively. Ultimately, this leads to increased biogenesis of autophagosomes and lysosomes, as well as, um, and this is important for maintaining uh, amino acid levels um, in these cells. So going forward, my lab now is interested in, um, these are just some of the questions that we're hoping to address. Um, so one is to understand in more detail the regulation of these transcription factors. How does IPO8 recognize these transcription factors in a cancer setting, but not in a normal setting? Are there post-translational modifications, other components of the complex that we are yet to um, understand? And certainly, given that IPO8 is also overexpressed in PDA, are there other uh, pro-tumorigenic transcriptional regulators that IPO8 are, is trafficking into the nucleus? Um, so we're, we're actively pursuing that. We're very interested in understanding what the substrates are um, of autophagy, uh, um, uh, of the autophagy pathway. And the reason for this is, for a very long time, it's been considered that autophagy is a very non-selective process. It randomly selects stuff in the cell that it then target, targets for degradation. And we'd like to think that it, this process can be very selective. There can be very specific cargos that are chosen for degradation based on function. Um, so, and I'll, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about how we're trying to address this question. And then lastly, we want to understand, if amino acids are the primary output, where do they ultimately go? Are they targeted more towards generation of specific protein species, or are they further catabolized to generate ATP, for bioenergetics? Um, so we're also using labeling experiments to be able to answer this question in more detail. So just some preliminary data to address the question of what might be some of the substrates of um, autophagy lysosomal degradation. Um, so to, in order to do this, if we consider the lysosome is the stomach of the cell and you want to know what these cells are eating, we have to be able to isolate the stomach and look inside. So this is what we have uh, started to do in the lab. We've um, taken LAMP1, which is a essential lysosomal membrane protein. Uh, LAMP1 and LAMP2 constitute about 50% of the lysosomal proteins. Um, we engineered a flow, uh, we tagged it with a fluorescent probe and an affinity handle that allows us to affinity purify intact lysosomes from cells. So uh, this is an IP uh, uh, of our um, using this tag from PDA cells. You can see we enrich for lysosomes uh, without any other contaminating organelles. Now in the past, most uh, uh, studies have been done using fractionation, but these are fraught with issues associated with contamination with uh, other organelles, but using this um, affinity-based approach, we actually get a very pure, high-yield um, uh, prep of uh, lysosomes from uh, PDA cells. And obviously, here you see in the flow through, all these other organelles um, are uh, in the flow through. We we also know that our tag is quite specific. It does it, it localizes to the right place. Um, we co-stain with LAMP2 here. As you can see, there's a, a really nice overlap, and some of our Preliminary mass spec analysis shows that we enrich for obviously lysosomal signatures um, as opposed to early endosome or, or mitochondria. So now using this, um, we can also treat with uh, a lysosomal inhibitor that allows us to enrich for the cargos because obviously once a cargo gets inside to the uh, inside the lysosome, it starts to become degraded, and we want to uh, be able to identify what these cargos are. So we, we can treat with either chloroquine or bathylomycin A, and you can see that bona fide autophagy cargos like LC3 and P, the adapter P62 become enriched under these conditions. So using this um, protocol, so no bath treatment or bathylomycin treatment, and we've also engineered a separate probe for mitochondrial purification as an additional control in our mass spec analysis. We then went on to identify what the cargos are, and this is just a preliminary analysis of what we found. We're very happy to see that, for example, serum albumin, as Cosimo showed, is an enriched lysosomal um, cargo, as you would expect, because these cells are highly macrophenocytic. Ubiquitinated proteins is also a highly enriched um, cargo. Again, as you would expect, many plasma membrane proteins have to be ubiquitinated in order to be targeted to the lysosome. But we also see some other very interesting um, candidates, splicing factors, translation machinery metabolic enzymes, 
and membrane proteins, many of which might have a negative role in tumor progression and are selectively de uh, degraded um, by these cells. Now, understanding how this happens um, and obviously validating some of these um, and showing where along a certain pathway um, they function is very important, and that's what we're doing right now. This is work uh, done by a graduate student in my lab and in collaboration with Dan Namur at UC Berkeley. So with that, uh, I just, you know, this is my lab right now, and we have, you know, we're very fortunate to have some really amazing collaborators, um, and then my funding here, and I'm, thank you for your attention.